Hi everyone, we're back here at Maker's Machining. Yesterday we uh, showed you how we cut this big angle on these uh, bronze bars. Uh, but I put the cart before the horse a little bit because I really wanted to show you about the uh, characteristics of a setup on the milling machine here before we got into anything. But that was such a good uh, uh, opportunity to show you some of the different setups and the versatility of the mill, I thought we'd just do that. But today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the uh, the table and how you set fixtures on the machine. Um, your your machine, uh, the top surface is your accuracy of your work, so you got to take care with that. Don't bounce things on it. Uh, every so often, you might want to take one of those nice round stones and just kind of go over it smooth to get any lumps and bumps out of there without grind or you know, without stoning a lot off your tabletop. These are uh, kind of a cast material that these tables are made out of. Um, They've got T-slots in them for T-nuts that uh, fit right in there. Uh, and then there are sets of uh, clamping uh, tools that you can use for holding your fixtures down. Uh, they fit in the T-slots. There's a selection of bolts and, and spacers. You don't have to buy a set like that if you're just starting out. Uh, you might want to make yourself a, a T-nut, uh, machine one, tap a hole in it, and then get some threaded rod, make it whatever length you need, then take a, a bar and put a, drill a hole in it and use that to clamp down your part on the table or your vise or whatever uh, and then get some kind of spacer there uh, to, to get the, the clamping pressure set right. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of walk over here uh, and, and show you, uh, I've, I've got this set up here loose on here so you can kind of see what we've got. We're clamping the vise down here and with this, with this strap clamp here I want to make sure that when I clamp, the tip of my strap clamp is making contact here, not that we're clamping like this. You need to clamp that thing so it holds down tight, and then you can slide your spacer behind the strap clamp over so you've got just a hair of daylight there. That means that your clamping force is right here. Also, your stud that uh, holds the clamp and clamps down your nut and everything, you want that as close to the part that you're clamping down as you can get it. Uh, I, I see too many times where people have their their bolt right back here and you're putting more clamping pressure on this than you are on your on your fixture or your vise or the part that you're machining and what that what that, that can do is uh, allow your part to move while you're machining so yeah you, you want to get the clamping set up correct in this case I just set that here so you could see it I didn't want to I, I couldn't use that in our setup yesterday with the with the bronze because if that clamp would have been right where I just showed you, I wouldn't have been able to get the uh, the uh, handle on the vise uh, in place there to, to turn it there. Anyhow, um, like I said, the table is a cast table. It, it slides back and forth on the top of the saddle. This is the saddle. And that is on the knee of the, the machine. The knee is this whole big contraption that slides up and down on the, the frame of the milling machine. Here we've got uh, uh, our our box ways on this particular one some machines have dovetails which is kind of a an angled uh, uh, guide way to hold the part or to hold the machine lined up uh, same thing on the uh, on the bottom side oh there's a dovetail on this one so uh, one's got a dovetail one's got box ways that's your accuracy machine and also those two axes are 90 degrees apart that you can't make any adjustments for it that is made into the machine the way it's made so you have to trust that as being uh, correct. Um, the T-slots in the table here, the T-nuts slide back and forth. They've got a little play in them. But these T-slots here are also machined. And uh, depending on the uh, make of the machine, these T-slots are accurately put in there, parallel with the face of the table, which is parallel to the dovetails underneath. Let's take a look underneath there. You can see the dovetails. Uh, it's an angled... Uh, surface there and that does have an adjustable give for tightening and loosening as wear occurs uh, but anyhow the the t-slot uh, is also machined and it's an accurate dimension so if if you have a mill and you want to use a couple of dowel pins in there or make a make a piece that's the right thickness to fit in there that gives you good locating uh, uh, position so you can slide something up against there um, yesterday I kind of did a bunch of stuff that I took for granted you'd know what I was doing or it was already there so I just 
didn't really give it a good explanation there, but a uh, couple things here. Uh, our spindle goes up and down. Uh, the end mill right here that we used was uh, held in an end mill holder, and it's got a set screw on the side of it. Sorry, I can't really turn it because it's in, in lower range. There's a set screw there to lock that end mill in there. Uh, that uh, cutter is held in by a drawbar that comes down through the spindle, but we're not going to talk about necessarily that right this minute. We're mainly going to focus on the table situation here. Um, yesterday when I machined this, I didn't say you have to have a nice sharp end mill to make the cut. That, that thing just came out spectacular. It really was looking good. I, I drilled the holes in there also, and uh, yesterday when I drilled those holes, I had to, first of all, I had to I laid out my part. You can, you might be able to see the layout line there and there. Uh, I came with the center drill. This is a center drill. We'll talk about those down the line. And all I did was get a little spot marked in there to get a, a good solid point for the drill to follow. Once I got all those marks in there, I went back with this drill and I drilled the hole. Uh, the screw in here is a 1032, I believe is what it was. 1032 or 1024. A number 10 sc uh, screw is 3 16ths of an inch in diameter. So you need clearance for that screw, so I used a 209 diameter drill. It's about 20 thousandths bigger than what the screw is. And then I went through and I drilled all those holes, and then I went back with a countersink. This is not the one I used, but this is, this is a countersink that would go in there and cut that countersink in the hole for the, for the screws to nest in. I had a hard time drilling the first couple holes because this drill had been sharpened, and I had never used the drill. And to do uh, cutting of bronze, you have to put a reverse angle on the cutting edge so it scrapes the, the bronze out of there instead of cutting. Because if you don't put a little flat on the cutting edge, when you go and drill and you break through, that thread or the, uh, the twist on the drill will act like a screw and it'll pull that thing through there so fast it might lift your part out of the vise, it might break the drill. So Putting the little flat face on that cutting edge will give you, uh, it'll scrape it out and it'll go pretty good. The first couple holes I drilled, I got about two thirds of the way through and I got one horrendous sounding squeak going on because the drill was getting bound up in the hole and it grabbed it. So I went and sharpened the drill again. I gave you a little story about sharpening drills here several episodes ago, but I sharpened it intentionally so it wasn't you know, centered properly. So it drilled a hair big, which after I did that, I was able to push that drill all the way through there and cut those holes. So that worked out real good. Uh, so, you know, I, I didn't talk about how we drilled those holes, but uh, I wanted to explain some of the things that I just did by nature of what I normally do. Um, anyhow, so uh, the table on the machine travels back and forth. That's the Z axis. Here's the Y axis, goes in and out. You can see I've got some oil on there. Again, this is your machine, and if you keep this thing lubricated properly, it'll last you for 50 or 60 years. They, they last a long time. But you got to keep it oiled. I've got an automatic oiler. Well, it's not an automatic. It's an oil pump on the, on the side of the machine there uh, that I just, you know, every so often I, I pull it out, and that pumps oil into the oil lines on the machine and keeps everything lubricated. I'm going to show you. Let me, let me grab this camera here a second. And I'm going to show you underneath here, you can see there's the manifold from the oil going right there to all the different parts of the machine. And just looking way back in there, this has got a ball screw in it. So the ball screw uh, has got a spring-loaded nut. Let me get this thing the right way here. It's got a spring-loaded nut, so there's little balls that follow that hole, that screw, and there's no backlash in that. And so the, the thing about the backlash is... With, with machines that are newer or CNC, they have ball screws in them, so there's absolutely no play in the table. If you have an older machine that does not have ball screws in it, then you're gonna have backlash that you have to compensate for. So if you're drilling a series of holes and you gotta come back and countersink them, you always wanna have the play of your handle going, when, when you get to your reading, you always wanna have the play on your handle going the same direction. That way, this thing here, it doesn't have any backlash, but you can get some old machines or the ones that don't have the ball screws, and you can have 15 to 30 thousandths play in the handle, and here's your dial with the, the readings on it. 
the the handle can can move thirty thousandths, but you haven't moved your table, so you could be way off with your hole location. So, whatever cut you make, always keep the a consistent rotation of your handle going the same way, so it always has the same play on the screw and everything. I always, uh, when I've got the handle that I'm turning, I always go uh, clockwise with it. I you know I may back up, but then I come back and go clockwise. Uh, you know we're looking at the at the uh, dials on here if you look at uh, the dial here I'm gonna bring this up to two hundred thousandths so suppose you have a machine that doesn't or actually is zero but it's it, two hundred thousandths per revolution if you have a machine that does not have a digital readout uh, that's fine you've got the dials on there those screws have the same pitch whether it's a, a screw or you're doing a readout I'm gonna set my y-axis at zero and now I'm going to turn this handle one revolution. I'm at zero. You can see 190 uh, is, is the last number marked. I'm going to go one full revolution. Bring it back up to our indicator line. And look at there. On the readout, it's 200 thousandths. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to turn this thing backwards here a little bit. It only went back a thousandth of an inch and it already reflected that on the readout so the readout is going to tell you exactly where the table has moved if you don't have a readout that's fine just keep the play of your handle going the same way with every rotation same thing over here on the on the z-axis how do you get that thing set to zero i'm just going to clean this off here you can see all the digits on here and if i'm i want to move this thing up somewhere i'm going to move it to my reading then there's a nut here that's loose I get my dial up to where I can get the zero lined up with the indicator mark there, and then I clamp this this locking nut on there. Oops, didn't it didn't lock. <laughs> I haven't used this for such a long time, it's not screwing on there tight. So let me oops, I'm having problems here with this one. Anyhow, this uh this screw here must have got out of adjustment, and I can't get it to, to move here now. Anyhow, so that I've learned something today. I got the readout on the machine and I guess I'll have to rely on that. But anyhow, uh, this handle for every revolution of the handle, is, is the machine goes 200 thousandths, I can't prove it to you here. But I'm gonna go about one full revolution. I went a little bit past. I, I don't have the, the numbers on here because the dial didn't stay with it. Uh, but anyhow, it's 200 thousandths per revolution on the cross slide and the uh, X, both X and Y axis. The, the crank here, excuse me, the crank here goes, raises the table or drops the table. Every revolution on this guy is a hundred thousandths. I can set that there, and you can see the last digit there. Instead of 190, like on the other handles, it's one revolution is a hundred thousandths. Okay, so you can get pretty good control of your uh, readings there. Excuse me again. Also, the quill here goes up and down, and this particular one has a readout on it uh, that's attached to the uh, the readout on the machine here. Uh, but that reads there's a it's a uh, glass scale in there or whatever they use. Uh, but it, it tells you within a half a thousandth of what where we've moved. I've moved 627 thousandths. If I bump it down a little bit, now it's at 615 and a half. Typically. You know, you can take away the last digit there because most of the time you're going to read in, uh, in three place decimals. But anyhow, um, take care of your machine. You've got T slots that help with the accuracy. I had this vice set up here out of the normal way. Uh, this gives you some chance to do other settings. You have to use an indicator to make sure the table is dead straight with the, the travels that you're doing, and all your cuts will come out right. So, square and concentric and straight are key ingredients to making a successful job. So anyhow, we'll uh, continue on with these milling machine operations and uh, we'll see you next time. So long.